Morning. Welcome to the USC Institute of Urology 60 Minutes program. Um, in these days of the coronavirus, um, we, although we are experiencing social distancing, yet um, by joining our hearts and by being uh, joining our, our uh, endeavors uh, by the electronic media, social distancing actually has brought us closer together. I mean, who would imagine uh, in the morning on a Thursday, we would have four or 500 of us joined around uh, learning from each other. So welcome again to the USC Institute of Urology uh, educational series. Uh, today we have really an outstanding program, uh, the world best surgeons in urethroplasty. Um, we have Professor Guido Barbagli. He uh, is from, uh, Ro from Italy. <laughs> he was born in Arezzo, a small village founded during the Roman Empire and grew up uh, near Caprese Michelangelo, where Michelangelo was born. And so it is appropriate that we have an artist such as uh, uh, Dr. Barbagli, uh, who has <clears throat> devoted himself to urethroplasty. <clears throat> he is director of the Center for Reconstructive Urethral Surgery, which he founded in 1999 in Arizona. 122 publications and really is one of the walking, talking legions in the field of um, urethroplasty. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Kulkarni is joining us from Pune, India. Uh, he is a urologist and a, a urethral reconstruction surgeon uh, second to none, <clears throat> world renowned, 35 years experience, has founded the Kulkarni Center in Pune, India, where not only does he treat urethral stricture patients from around the world, but he has established a permanent educational program for urologists who are interested in in-depth uh, reconstructive urethral surgery learning. He was awarded the Urology Gold Medal by the Urology Society of India. Professor Kulkarni is president of the Society International Urology currently, and uh, it is a real pleasure uh, for us to have uh, Sanjay on the program today. And right next to us, Chairman of the Department of Urology of University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, Hunter is a close and dear friend. Uh, he is associate editor of the International Journal of Competence Research, holds multiple uh, uh, positions of distinction uh, in the American Urologic Association, and uh, uh, really is one of the thought leaders in this field. The program today uh, on urethroplasty is pretty much the same program that Dr. Wessels runs at the AUA as a postgraduate symposium, uh, again with Drs. Kulkarni and Barbaglia as his uh, um, uh, faculty. Uh, thank you, Hunter. Thank you, Guido. Thank you, uh, um, Sanjay, for joining in. And uh, from uh, USC side, this program will be hosted by uh, Professor Leo Domanian. Uh, Dr. Domanian is uh, co-director of our uh, ureth urethral reconstruction and prosthetic surgery section. Uh, Leo is again a dear, dear friend, a thought leader in the department and outside. And over to you, Leo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gill. <clears throat> Welcome new friends and old to Urology 60 Minutes, the University of Southern California's Masters of Urology Zoom clinical series. Today we discuss urethroplasty best in class. To say best in class is truly, truly an understatement. It is a privilege to welcome our panel today, consisting of Dr. Wessels, Dr. Barbaglia, and Dr. Sanjay Kulkarni. Their contributions to the field of urology have catapulted GU reconstruction into the modern era. 1996 was a big year for GU re reconstruction. Wessels and Mackinich first described the ventral onlay graft urethroplasty. Concomitantly, that same year, Barbagli et al. 
described the dorsal omelette graft urethroplasty. Combine this with Dr. Sanjay Kulkarni, the man who has perfected the posterior urethroplasty, and we are in for a true treat today. Now for our first speaker, Dr. Guido Barbagli. This Renaissance, Renaissance man from Arezzo, Italy, was born near Caprese Michelangelo, where the Michelangelo was born. Given his geographical proximity to greatness, it is no surprise that there would be no modern field of GU reconstruction without his contributions to the field. You cannot talk about urethroplasty without mentioning his many numerous groundbreaking publications and descriptive book chapters on surgical technique. He is currently the director of the Center for Reconstructive Urethral Surgery, which he founded in 1999 in Arezzo, Italy, his birthplace. Please let us give a warm welcome to Dr. Guido Barbagli as he lectures us on penile urethroplasty. Hey, Giovanni. Giovanni. Share screen. You, you're muted. I, I, I approve. Uh, echo okay, approve yes, screen. Professor. So you have to say hi to everybody and open, please, and share your screen. No, mi ha detto. You got to talk in Italian. Uh, okay, uh, Professor. Mi è ritornato di nuovo. Ok, non si preoccupi, non si preoccupi. Adesso, no, 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 no. Ok, adesso clicchi sul PowerPoint. Ah, PowerPoint. Sì, sì ok. Eccolo, perfetto. Ora è entrato. Ora in modalità presentazione. È entrato? Sì. sì, sì Ora sì, metto quali... in modalità presentazione. Leo, I'm loving it already. Ecco, perfetto. <ride> Posso parlare? Absolutely, yes. Ok. Thank you to everybody. Now... Okay. Let me present the problem of penile urethroplasty. Why problems for when we discuss about penile urethroplasty? They, they are new, very, very many, many thinking when we compare penile and the bulbar or posterior urethroplasty. Penile urethroplasty is the most challenging and difficult problem in reconstructive urethral surgery. Why? because patient had important psychological involvement of the, the disease, because the disease involved the penis. More, they are unrealistic and overstated the patient expectancy for surgery. Patient believe that you can solve any problem. Be, they are in penile urethroplasty, high risk of aesthetic cosmetic problem for the penis and genitalia. This don't happen in the bulbar or posterior urethra. They are high risk of surgery failure due to erection and sexual activity. And more, they are lower success rate for any technique compared to bulbar or posterior urethroplasty. More, more, they are many, many available technique in one or two stage, but they are no general consensus or superiority of one technique over the other. There are many su technical surgical aspects when we discuss about penile urethroplasty. One stage versus two stage repair. Pedicled skin flap versus free graft. Temporary or definitive urinary diversion, like meatotomy, Johansson fifth stage urethroplasty, perineal urethrostomy. The first uh, uh, topic I like to discuss with you with, is uh, uh, the, the, the first problem is in penile urethra disease, one stage or two stage repair? When one stage repair is depending about uh, the etiology of the stricture, the radiological feature and the clinical feature of the penis of the patient to decide one stage or two stage. Let me show you. For example, etiology is important. In leaker sclerosis etiology, rarely, rarely we can use one stage repair. In file hypospadia repair, we can use some time. 
in trauma sometime, but in other etiology, idiopathic, catheter, instrumentation, infection, we can almost airway according to the clinical parameter of the penis. Important before planning the urethroplasty, check the, R, the retrograde, not voiding, the retrograde urethrography. And you can see in the left side, in this case, the structure is no obliterative, and this is a typical, good for one stage repair. But at the right, you can see the penile urethra is completely destroyed. This patient requires two stage repair. Also, Penile appearance is important. When the penis is normal, no pre surgery, no scar, it's evident that you can do one stage repair. But in file hypospadia repair, as you can see, or in leaky sclerosis disease, is not possible. You need choice to stage repair. When we discuss about two stage repair, what is the best? One stage? is the best using graph or flap. You know that uh, many, many uh, flap urethroplasty are designed in America by, for example, Jack Menach, Jack, Me Jack Mechanich and Hunter Vessels. And uh, the, the best one stage repair using graph is recently 2001 designed by the Indian nine surgeon Azopa. Let me show you something about uh, this uh, graph or flap. Wow, the, how this take decision for clinical parameters for decision making? Because the problem is that the literature don't provide data about the superiority on one technique versus, versus another one. In conclusion, decide to do one stage by graph or by flap is depending to your background and the surgeon preference. The literature is not uh, sure. But uh, let me re refer to you my experience uh, about the use of one stage penile skin flap urethroplasty. For me, is a tragedy because it uh, requires great experience in tissue transfer surgical procedure. I never had when I was younger. The, the use of a penile skin flap is make great, great aggression of the penile component, skin, dartos, vascular supply, increase the operative time, increase the risk of postoperative early and late complication, including aesthetic penile appearance, increase the risk of diverticular information, because any skin flap is unsupported. Let me show you. This is the, the Jack Mechanic uh, circulocutaneous flap, and down you can see the Orandi flap. But do, you can see that this kind of unsupported skin flap, over time, create a diverticulum. Look what happened in my end of course, not in your end, in my end, when I use any kind of skin flap urethroplasty. I don't like, I never, never use this kind of procedure. In something very, very rarely, I use Orandi modified flap, as we published in British Journal of Urology, but rarely. So, the problem in penile skin flap urethroplasty is that any postoperative complication involve not only the functional aspect, but also the aesthetic appearance of the penis and the genitalia. And that this had great negative psychological impact on patient. Patient come to you and say, doctor, look, you destroy my penis. Thank you very much. So, the problem in penile urethroplasty, the target is uh, to improve the patient obstructive symptom without, uh, without produce uh, postoperative sequela more serious than the obstruction. Some patient come back and say, doctor, okay, I avoid well, but I can have sexual activity. 
because I was in, embarrassed to present my penis at the woman. So now let me show the advantage of uh, the graph urethroplasty using the graph. Don't require special training. It's very easy. Anything you can do this kind of, of a procedure. Don't require, as I show you later, any aggressive approach to a penile component. Decrease the operative time. In my clinic, to do one graph penile urethroplasty, we need 45 minutes. Decrease the risk of postoperative complication. No any diverticulum, postoperative diverticulum, and more and more advantage, as I show you, thank you to Sanjay Kulkarni, this surgery can be performed using perineal approach without touching the penis. And you can see here the Azopa technique we performed in my center. You see the stretcher, we, we don't touch the urethra, just we, we open, we make incision on the midline, like a snodgrass incision. We put the graph with the, with the glue, we press 45 seconds, the graph is applied on the midline of urethral plate and we close. This requires 45 minutes. No complication. It's like circumcision, not more. And you can see, I learned this from my friend Sanjay, you can do the same procedure by perineal approach. You push the penis down in perineum, you make the same. You open the urethra, you inside the urethral plate, you put the graph and you close it. This is fantastic suggestion from Sanjay because you repair penile urethral stricture disease, but you don't touch the penis. This is fundamental for patient. So, and you can see in my experience, the on-stage oral mucosa graph urethroplasty present the most high success rate. And you can see that in my end of Kurz, not in the end of Anter or, or, or Jack Mechanic, the on-stage skin graph urethroplasty had very, very bad long-term success rate. Another question about the penile urethroplasty is when they use the oral mucosa at the first stage or what? We never, never use oral mucosa at the first stage in phylacospadia repair, and we use only this, only in lichen sclerosis. Let me show how we do. You, you see that in lichen sclerosis disease is the only possibility is oral mucosa graft at the first stage, removing anything and put the oral mucosa here. But why? we don't like, we stop using oral mucosa at the first stage in phyla pospadia repair. We publish in the European Urology 2006 that after this implant of the first stage, 39 of the patient presenting scarring and retraction of the oral mucosa. I don't accept. I can accept one technique that provide me 39 of these uh, results. I can accept. I stop using this in final for spider repair. And what do we do now? I, I in design this technique with my friend Sanjay. We do that we use the oral mucosa only at the second stage. At the first stage, we do only Johansson procedure. We don't implant nothing, just open the urethra. But later we, I show you better. And uh, this is the, how is the, the appearance after one Johansson procedure. And we do to close uh, the Azopa technique, incision of the urethral plate, the graft and the closing. And uh, this technique improved our result. So in conclusion, the use of oral mucosa but I'll show you later, at the second stage urethroplasty help you to avoid the retraction of the graph, requiring more revision of the first stage urethroplasty. Oral mucosa is fantastic material for urethroplasty, but required to be closed inside in the urethra, not remain 
at the uh, dirty higher. In conclusion about uh, Pinai Retropassiva, uh, we surgeon background and experience preference is the best uh, uh, suggestion I can offer you about Pinai Urethroplasty. So the message is uh, don't touch, don't destroy, don't destroy the penis. But uh, when we discuss about Pinai Urethroplasty, there are two more important uh, complex Pinai Urethrostriture the phylaphospadia repair and the lichen sclerosis disease. Let me spend five minutes about this. The first one, phylaphospadia repair is not a stricture. When patient come to me and they say, doctor, I have a stricture after hypospadia repair. I say, no, you don't have a stricture. You have a complex congenital disorder of the genitalia and the uretra. It's completely different is completely different. Not urethra stricture disease, it's complex disorder. So patient may realize how complex is, is the problem if you use this word here, not urethra stricture disease. The same when patient come back and show me the penis, like you can see here in the left side, and say, I have a urethra stricture disease. No, no, sir you have a complex immunological disorder involving the urethra. It's different, completely different. I can't solve your problem. I can't solve your problem. Realize this. It's important to use a great word for the disease. So why this uh, uh, phylaphospider repair is complex? Because the patient underwent many, many prior failed the treatment. Patient had the important psychological involvement on the disease and had a realistic, a realistic and overstated patient expectancy for surgery. More, the urethral stricture disease in phylaphospada repair is very complex. Why? They are no corpus pongiosum. They are scarred tissue involving penile skin, dartos fascia and glands. And they are no well vascularized tissue available for reconstruction. This rendered this surgery very, very difficult. So, and I present you again what we designed with Sanjay. You see, at the beginning, many years ago, we used this one stage oral mucosa graph. When you finish surgery, you enjoy it. Oh my God, B very good, very good, nice, nice. But what happened? When a patient present you after six months, like this one, is okay. You are happy. Oh my God, fantastic, my compliment. I am very skilled, I am very good, oh my God. But if the patient present this, it's very easy to close, very nice, and to perform the second stage. But as I showed you before, 39 of the patient come back like this. And they say, doctor, but what do you do? What do you do? Look at my penis now. And you say, ah, oh, Baba, I apologize. You need one more revision after one more. Doctor, you explain me to stage repair. It's just for time I come to you. You stop or not, or we go like this. For this reason, I don't use this uh, technique and I move like this. Another thinking is that, that when you use this technique, you need to take from the mouth very, very big rectangular graft and you don't close the Arvensty side. And this is very fastidious for patient. Patient had the bleeding for a few days, had the problem. It's no good for, for patient satisfaction. Now, this is patient with uh, phylaphospider repair. I show you what we do. We do as Johansson procedure. We open the urethra, but it's important open the urethra very aggressively, two, three centimeters in healthy urethra, not only the stricture part. You can see here in the right side the stricture white in the middle and the well opening P. 
pink mucosa here. This is nice Johansson procedure. And the patient is requested to remain like this for six months. He can do sexual activity, anything, no, no catheter. The only request is pay attention because uh, it's better if you avoid seated than in standing position. And after six months, I show you the fantastic Azopa technique. The Azopa technique is the most, the most important evolution in urethral surgery about penile urethra in the last 30 years. You the same, incision of the urethral plate, the graph is inside, and then you close. 45 minutes surgery. So another thing, and I finish, let me know. But sometimes patient come to you, 69 year old, with many, many, many surgery for phylopospadia repair, two son, married, five pre previous file of urethroplasty, and he underwent periodic dilation. What do you do on this case? No alternative. This patient require perineal urethrostomy. This patient requires perineal urethrostomy. Not for the urethra, for the bladder. In some meeting we discuss about this. The decision to do perineal urethrostomy is not for the urethra, it's for the bladder. When patient present you the bladder like you can see here, you need to decrease the length of the urethra and the resistance to, overflow, to, to the urinary flow. The only way is perineal definitive urethrostomy. We have many, many patients with this uh, uh, solution and are very, very happy. So, and another thinking uh, is, uh, I finish, uh, leaky sclerosis. Why is complex? Because they are important psychological involvement, because the disease involves the penis. For the male, don't touch my penis, please. And uh, is one immunological, chronic, aggressive disorder. No available effective medical therapy and they are high risk of disease recurrency. You need to inform patient what is leaky sclerosis. It's not urethral stricture disease, immunological complex disorder. Well, how is our steps in leaky sclerosis disease? First one, before planning surgery, we take biopsy from glands and penile skin because we need to be sure about the diagnosis, histological diagnosis of leaky sclerosis. It's not clinical, it's histological diagnosis. And you need to inform patient about the histological diagnosis, the nature of disease, and the high risk of recurrence. You show at the patient the, the histological examination, you say, look, look here, this is the, this is the problem. After that, Another thinking that is not common. Some people don't accept this. In any patient with leaky sclerosis disease, urethral in, in involvement, you need the first one after biopsy perform retrograde and devoid urethrography. Why? Because uh, we publish uh, in Lancet and after in uh, Journal of Urology, 52% of patients presenting meatal stenosis due to leaky sclerosis had panurethral stricture disease, 52%. So you believe that the, the, the disease was all in the meatus and you open, you open, you open, you open, you open, you open, and you arrive at the prostate. So no patient enter in my operating room without retrograde urethrogram, if the diagnosis is leaky sclerosis disease. This is important preoperative uh, involvement of, of, of patient. And uh, sometimes look uh, in attention the X-ray, is important to, to look also the void in urethrography. Because this patient, for example, with leaky sclerosis disease, you can see here, the problem is only in the meatus navicularis urethra. This patient requires simple meatotomy and stop. 
if you do myotomy, you avoid the progression of the disease, as we wrote in Journal of Virology. So look with attention the retrograde and the voiding Rx of your patient. And uh, of course, uh, we can do remove anything, put the oral mucosa, and if it's nice, like on this case, we can do the second stage repair. But uh, uh, is a, is a challenging problem. You can see some patients where we do fifth stage oral mucosa graft urethroplasty, they look well. And uh, okay, I finish. In conclusion, uh, the repair of a complex spinal urethral disease, like phylacospada repair and helicus sclerosis, the success rate is very poor lesser than 70%. And uh, probably in the future, the repair of phylacospada repair may have great improvement when it will be possible to have corpus spongius available, but not now. And uh, a great improvement in repair of the sclerosis structure disease will be possible only when efficient medical therapy will be available. Now we start a new, a new therapy, medical therapy for lichen sclerosis ne next year. So what about tissue engineering in uh, urethra? You know, we have uh, this great experience in Germany with this fantastic product, but uh, at the present is uh, uh, the number of the patients are mainly in the bulba urethra and the success rate are like the native oral mucosa. But we are also working with Professor Graziella Pellegrini in Italy, arranging a new oral mucosa product for two-stage hypospadia, phylapospadia repair. Probably we can start the phase one study next year, and this maybe should improve our results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Barbagli. You are truly a legend in the field, and that was a wonderful, wonderful lecture. Now we will go to Dr. Hunter Wessels. Gio, can you uh, put him on the screen, please? Dr. Wessels, a graduate fellow of GU Reconstruction with Dr. Jack Mackinich. Dr. Wessels is a researcher and expert in GU trauma, reconstruction, and erectile dysfunction. As I did a literature search on him the other day, I was quite astonished at his keen interest in urological complications of diabetes mellitus, focusing on strategies to reduce the burden of disease through improved prediction and prevention. Most impressive about Dr. Wessels, however, is his love of the outdoors. He rose, hikes, and is an avid cyclist. When he finds time away from his vegetable garden, he serves the urological community on many national and international committees. And he happens to be a professor and chairman of the University of Washington in Seattle, a powerhouse in urology. Let us welcome Dr. Hunter Wessels as he enlightens us on a bulbar urethroplasty lecture. Good morning. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with all of you at the University of Southern California with my friend Andy Gill, Leo Dumanian, Guido, and Sanjay. I first came to USC to do surgery and give lectures at LA County Hospital. I met Leo when he was a resident at Temple University and have followed his career with great admiration. And I've been fortunate to work with the true masters of my field, Guido Barbagli in Arezzo, Italy, and Sanjay and Guido both in Pune, India. We've had a course at the AUA for a number of years, and it's always a pleasure to learn something from my, my co-presenters. I'm going to spend 20 minutes talking about bulbar urethral stricture, <clears throat> focusing on primary anastomosis, grafting, and some variations on the theme. 
This is a picture of our trauma center here at the University of Washington, Harborview Medical Center. And it's really a laboratory where we see the immediate effects of injury, whether a pelvic crush injury, a straddle injury, or something worse, and the delayed consequences, one of which is stricture. And this conceptual model here of urethral injury shows three broad categories in which we could place an, a urethral stricture etiology. The crush injury, which could be a straddle injury, some blow to the perineum, creates crush and tissue ischemia and fairly significant fibrosis. Battlefield injuries create tissue loss and require a totally different set of strategies, which are really beyond the scope of this talk. And then there are the strictures that are more likely to be iatrogenic or inflammatory or infectious. And, and their underlying mechanism is different. And they don't have the full thickness tissue loss that we see with a crush or a, or a battlefield injury. Let's take the base case, a 21-year-old man with a newly diagnosed one centimeter bulbar stricture. He had weak flow and other symptoms. A urologist performed cystoscopy, and we can see a narrow opening. Retrograde urethrogram shows a short stricture in the proximal bulb. And we have a number of options listed here from the AUA guidelines. The real decision-making is between the patient and the surgeon. What are their goals? And some patients will go with the, the minimization of repeat interventions. That patient should have surgery so that they never have to come back. Other patients will choose to have the least invasive procedure, even though the risks of recurrence are higher. For the rest of the talk, we'll focus on urethroplasty, but these other options are totally appropriate for the right patient at the right time. A few anatomic principles are important to consider. The bulbar urethra receives its blood supply from branches of the common penile artery, namely the bulbourethral artery, which extends along the length of the corpus spongiosum. It's paired, and in normal cases, there's additional flow from the dorsal artery in a retrograde fashion back this way. So we can excise a portion of the stricture of the urethra and expect good healing. Another principle is that the bulbar urethra has some inherent elasticity and it can stretch a few centimeters so that we can cut out some tissue and bring the ends back together. You can do this simply by stretching it or by reducing the distance between the two points, which we do more often for pelvic fracture urethral injuries. One of the key questions is when to transect and when not to transect. And there's a lot of debate and controversy around this in our field right now. Certainly when there's an obliteration of the urethra, that makes it easy for everybody. There's really no choice. You have to cut out the scar and bring the ends back together. Dense fibrosis, whether from a straddle injury or previous surgery, often requires some transecting. And the last circumstance related to grafting is that transecting the urethra immediately exposes the dorsum of the urethra and the tunica albuginea and makes it easy to lay a graft down there. So the key message is you need to know the mechanism. And this particular patient, we know what the mechanism is. That hurts, and that's going to create full thickness, spongiofibrosis, probably obliteration of the urethra. He'll have a stricture like this. He'll probably have a suprapubic tube, and there'll be no real connection between the two ends of the urethra. When we operate on him, you can see that he has a visual narrowing and constriction of the corpus spongiosum because he has lost the spongy vascular tissue around the urethra. That's visible on his pathology. Here's the spongy tissue out here, but closer to the urethra, it's all replaced by dense scar. And we can get excellent results with excision and primary anastomosis. 
the results are so good that we really shouldn't be changing this operation in my opinion. We should use it in appropriate circumstances. But not all one centimeter strictures in the bulbar urethra are the same. An important question that comes up is, does urethroplasty affect penile erection? And this is a meta-analysis of over 2,000 patients from 25 or 30 studies. And you can see that overall, there's very little effect of urethroplasty on sexual function. But there are a few outlying papers, and there's a signal here. There are a few patients in these groups who had a transecting urethroplasty who had a significant persistent reduction in erectile function. It might be 5%, it might be 10%. So these cases occur, but they're very rare. And my approach is to balance the risks and benefits. If we go back and look at rates that are this high, we should not throw out such good results to mitigate a very small risk. We should balance those. So there are circumstances when we should not transect the urethra. When the stricture is shorter and more like a web and not associated with circumferential fibrosis and, and a straddle injury, we can avoid transecting the urethra. The other circumstance would be in cases where the urethral blood supply has been compromised, such as prior hypospadia surgery, prior anastomotic urethroplasty, or perhaps a pelvic fracture urethral injury. We should preserve the blood supply to the corpus spongiosum in these cases. So here's a different 21-year-old. His urethrogram looks kind of the same, although it's hard to measure this accurately because of the rotation of the urethra and magnification. So this is a limited circumstance where I would perform a urethral ultrasound under anesthesia before making my decision on surgery. And I would measure this. It's short. It's in the bulbar urethra. He did not have a straddle injury. I'm going to try and do this without transecting. And the classic operation is described by Andrich and Monday back in 2012. They've mobilized the urethra dorsally off the erectile bodies. Here's a schematic of the two erectile bodies. They've made a linear longitudinal incision across the strictured area, and then we're going to close it transversely. This is the classic Heineke Miculitz rearrangement that you can see here. Any tube that has a narrowing can undergo rearrangement. The key is that the narrowing be short enough and that the tissue be elastic enough so that you can rearrange it. That's why it won't work on a dense straddle injury. There's too rigid uh, a, a stricture around it. And that's why it won't work for a very long stricture because you can't span enough distance. A question is, well, why don't you make your strictureplasty ventrally? Wouldn't it be easier than, than having to mobilize and work dorsally? The problem is this ultrasound tells the story. First of all, dorsally, there's very little spongy tissue, so you get very easily into the lumen and can rearrange it. Ventrally, you have to go through all this spongy tissue. It would bleed a lot, and you see the the bulbourethral arteries are quite close to the lumen of the urethra, and I would worry about potentially catching these arteries in your sutures and then defeating the whole purpose of the non-transecting approach. I'd like to switch gears over the remaining few minutes and talk about longer bulbar urethral strictures. Here's a urethrogram. This stricture is clearly a couple centimeters long. It's in the proximal bulbar urethra. It looks like it may stop just before we get to the membranous urethra here. I follow the saying of my, my colleague Sanjay Kalkarni, when it's distal, go dorsal. Because out here, it's easy to get to dorsally. 
there's not as much corpus spongiosum ventrally, and you have a perfect graft bed in the, the corpora cavernosa. So when it's distal, go dorsal. But when you start heading up towards the proximal bulbar urethra and the sphincter and viru montanum, it's easier to actually go ventral and do it from the inside of the urethra. So here's a picture of a case where I'm getting ready to do a ventral onlay. We've opened the corpus spongiosum. You can see it's thick and pink and healthy. That's going to wrap around the graft very easily. And you can see that I'm looking back here towards the more proximal urethra. And if I need to go further, I can keep working inside the urethra to extend the urethrotomy all the way back to the viru. The other key principle here is that you have to have a good, healthy spongiosum to wrap around your graft. After you place it here, you'd put your graft right in here, sew it in, and then do the spongioplasty to provide support and blood supply for your graft. The results would suggest that dorsal and ventral onlay grafts have similar outcomes. Although I think there's an inherent selection bias where more experienced surgeons who do more complex surgery go to the dorsal approach when they have a more difficult problem. And I suspect that if you randomize patients that you would see better results with the dorsal in select more difficult cases. And I'll just show you an example of this from our own work. We compared a series of about 100 urethroplasties. We do both in our practice. And you can see that the results in terms of failure rates were essentially the same. There was no significant difference. But what you can see is that we used an augmented approach more in the dorsal onlay than the ventrals. And the rest of the characteristics were pretty similar. To me, this is a proxy for a more complex stricture. Now, what do you do about a more severely narrowed segment? This is where it becomes difficult to perhaps do a ventral onlay because you lose any significant urethral plate. We don't want to tubularize. We want to preserve the urethral plate. You can't really do an ASOPA because the urethra is so narrow that you can't split it in half. And so this is where the augmented anastic amotic approach has been very useful. Here's an ultrasound visualization. You can see there's a three centimeter long stricture it's very narrow. There's even a small calcification in the wall of it. What I used to do is I used to open ventrally, cut this out, reanastomose, and do the ventral onlay. But probably the more reliable approach would be to do it dorsally. Here I've cut out that portion of the stricture. Here's one end of the bulbar urethra. Here's the other end. I lay my graft down on the dorsum and then I close things back up. Augmented anastomotic urethroplasty. It's the workhorse of the difficult bulbar stricture. The last thing I'd like to point out is, is an innovation of Guido's from about seven years ago. You see, when the urethral plate gets very narrow like this, the brown is the urethral plate. This is a longitudinal view. It's really, you either have to cut it out, or how do you sew to the other side of this? Well, Guido's innovation is over here on the right, where you see he sews one edge. This point corresponds to this suture line here. And then on the other side, he doesn't even bother bringing it down to the urethral plate. This plate is so narrow that it might be hard to get a second set of sutures in. So he just tacks his graft down on the other side here when he's doing a ventral onlay or a dorsal for a very narrow urethral plate. You don't remove anything, you don't transect, 
and you use your graph. There are limitations to the onlay graft of whether it's dorsal or ventral. The distal bulbar urethra, we can usually solve that problem with a dorsal onlay. When you have a reoperative bulbar stricture, if the first operation was dorsal, you go ventral. And if the first operation was ventral, you go dorsal. It's that simple. You just go where someone hasn't been before. Sometimes we still have to cut out some of these strictures and do augmented and astigmatic approaches. But then there are things like stents. Here's a urethrogram. Maybe you can see that there's a uh, stent in his proximal bulbar urethra extending up into his membranous urethra. And with prior pelvic or prostatic irradiation, it makes for very difficult circumstances. In these cases, I would try to do a dorsal onlay. But if I can't, then I think about vascularized tissue transfer, either a skin flap or placing a buccal graft onto a gracilis muscle and then plastering it on ventrally, or even more complex solutions. But these will be very rarely needed. So in summary, excision and primary anastomotic repair of short bulbar strictures is the gold standard, but should be reserved for the select cases where there's a clear traumatic etiology, full thickness injury, and strong indications to transect. The risks of erectile and ejaculatory dysfunction are low but real, and you either take Guido's approach and never do it, or you take my approach and you counsel appropriately and have the patient share in the decision making. And I think we should be doing more non-transecting approaches in selected cases. These are not easier surgeries. Actually, it's harder not to transect because you're working behind the urethra, there's not as much room, and it can get challenging. So I try and use a precision medicine approach when I'm choosing between dorsal and ventral graphs based on the stricture characteristics, location, length, narrowness, the cause, and host factors, body mass, uh, other factors to choose the right operation. And the key is to always be prepared to escalate to the next reconstructive technique. If you think you might have to do it a ventral, well, you better be prepared to do a dorsal or an EPA or something else on top of it, even a staged operation. And so I made a short list of what the skills I think you need to have to do successful bulbar urethroplasty. Well, from superficial to deep, you need to work with skin and know how to harvest full thickness skin grafts, whether it's from the mouth or elsewhere. You need to be able to create a penile skin flap, although I use them rarely and I share Guido's concerns about some of the complications and cosmetic consequences. I think tunica vaginalis flaps are also important adjuncts that we can use for coverage. As you get deeper, you need to be able to carefully and safely mobilize the corpus spongiosum from top to bottom. The gracilis flap is an important advance that came out of the Leahy Clinic and Leonard Zinman that I think needs to be in the armamentarium. And then for the very rare cases, you might need to revascularize the bulbar urethra if there's been prior ischemic loss or maybe even consider a total reconstruction of the urethra. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'll close with a case. This was a young man who had had a pelvic fracture and because of ischemic problems, he lost his whole bulbar urethra. And we had about 10 centimeters extending from the prostate down to the distal bulb that was completely absent. So we created a paddle of skin from his forearm and we created a urethral tube. This is not a phalloplasty, it's just the inner tube of a phalloplasty. And we replaced his whole urethra here. He subsequently urinated normally, returned to normal erections, and had three children. So we know that this worked. With that, I'd like to conclude and thank Dr. Gill, Dr. Dumanian, my co-speakers for a very informative and enlivened session. And I'd also like to thank all the people back home here 
at the University of Washington who helped support this work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wessels. I'm so sorry about what happened. That was disorienting, but you powered through it. You're a trooper. Let me just give you a quick introduction, Dr. Kulkarni. All right. A world-renowned specialist in reconstructive urology, this pioneer and innovator in GU reconstruction, along with his friend, Dr. Do Dr. Bauer Bagley, introduced a new technique on one-sided urethroplastic <laughs> on buccal urethroplasty, affectionately known as the Kulkarni urethroplasty. His innovative techniques continue to push the envelope of what is possible in the field of GU reconstruction. The Kulkarni Endosurgery Institute in Pune, India is an international referral destination for the most challenging and difficult pelvic fracture urethral distraction defects. No. This man can do things operatively that others have only dreamed of. However, the true surgical talent of the household is his lovely wife, who is a general surgeon and will sometimes perform operations with him. Let us welcome Dr. Sanjay Kolkarni as he educates us on the posterior urethroplasty. So uh, I thank our Professor Indigal, Chairman Department of Urology at USC and Dr. Leo for inviting me for this uh, session uh, webinar on urethroplasty today. Uh, my topic today is on posterior urethroplasty. Uh, India has 1% vehicles of the world, but our accident rate is 6%. With a population of 1.6, 1 1.3 billion, we have a large number of patients of pelvic fracture urethral injury patients. So when a patient has a road traffic accident and there is a pelvic fracture, there is a 10% chance that he may have a ruptured urethra. The usual site of injury is the uh, bulbomembrane junction. The patient usually comes in a shock position. The blood pressure is low. Uh, we have to um, do, take measures to, to make his life sustainable, treat him for emergency hypotension, neurological, thoracic, abdominal injuries. And then whenever the blood pressure comes up, he may go into retention. If you can feel the bladder on ultrasound scan, one can put a suprabibic cystostomy or a suprabibic tube. Mm, and then uh, once the patient is stable, maybe 48 hours later, maybe sev up to seven days, one can do an early endoscopic realignment. That is to be done with an endoscope from above and below. So if the uh, rupture of the urethra is partial, there is a chance that the patient may not need urethroplasty further, mm, or if he develops a stricture, it may be handled with uh, um, a DVIU knife. You know, but most of the time, the injury is complete and there is a gap between the two ends of the urethra with an endoscopic realignment. The two ends of the um, urethra are um, brought in line and the gap can be reduced. So subsequently, the surgery becomes simpler. So this is to be offered by a urologist. Most important, uh, don't allow the in, uh, hematoma to be infected. Otherwise, the patient will develop a pelvic abscess. Usually three months later, one needs an anastomotic urethroplasty. So there are some centers where they put in a suprabibic tube initially. They don't advocate early endoscopic realignment. And then three months later, they perform anastomotic urethroplasty. As I said before, the most common site um, is bulbomembranous. And previously, it was thought that it is bulboprostatic. So if you read the books, they say the anastomosis is bulboprostatic. This happens rarely in children where the prostate is not developed and is uncommon to have a, um, a bul um, prostatic um, injury at the apex of prostatic urethra. Uh, some patients may need a laparotomy. Those one with a bladder tear, we have to repair it. With the bladder neck tear, you go and repair it immediately. Those patients who give history of rectal tear, uh, rectal injury, one needs colostomy. Mm -hmm. And then if the bladder is not filled up, one can do an open suprabibic cystostomy. Most important point here is not to perform an open railroad technique because the incidence of erectile dysfunction increases from 20 to 40%. And if you drain the hematoma, the patient will, will bleed more. So don't touch the hematoma. Once, once the patient comes 
to us at the end of three months, we want to investigate the patient. Uh, we uh, first in investigation, we want to know is a retrograde urethrogram, RGU, and simultaneous MCU, micturating system urethrogram. So this is performed by urologists under CM inside the operating room in our center. So quarter time from Egypt uh, had a formula called bulbo prostatic gap divided by length of the bulbar urethra because we are going to stretch the bulbar urethra to join it to the membranous urethra. So in the left, you can see the gap is small, less than two centimeter, and the length of bulbar urethra is about seven centimeter, less than one third. So there is less chance of epectomy. On the right, you can see that the patient has mm, a long gap compared to the length of the bulbar urethra. So there is a higher chance of patient requiring epectomy. The second investigation I would like to offer the patient is whether he gives history of erectile dysfunction or not to do a duplex color Doppler um, uh, pre and post papaverin injection of the corporal blood supply and most important in an operated patient also of the dorsal penile arteries which lie dorsal to the uh, lateral to the um, deep dorsal vein. I will come to that a little later. So we do duplex color Doppler in all patients. We published the largest series of PFUI, pelvic fracture urethral injuries, about two years ago in a World Journal of Urology, 1,307 patients, and pubectomy rate in India was about 61%. The third investigation is an MRI that is not offered for all patients, but those with a complex pelvic fracture urethral injury, such as uh, double block or um, erectile fistula. If you are worried about um, bladder neck problem, uh, very too open, one can offer an MRI. Uh, we draw a horizontal line at the bottom of the pubic bone. If the urethra lies below the this horizontal line, then there is less chance of pubectomy. If the urethra is high up compared to the inferior margin of the pubic bone, there is a higher uh, chance that the patient may need um, the pubectomy. Then we offer 3D CT scan. In some patients who have a complex pelvic fracture injury, there is a lot of displacement or there could be bony fragment impinging on the bladder neck. And we have now recently started doing 3D printing and it is helpful for fellows to understand the anatomy, where to go and search for the posterior urethra and then how much pubectomy is required. So this is an investigational tool. Then once it comes to surgery, the approaches come into six steps. The commonest steps are in the perineal approach. I make a midline perineal incision, bulbar urethra mobilization. George Webster in 1986 described the elaborated perineal approach of corporal separation, inferior pubectomy, and supracrural rerouting of the urethra. Then my guru, Richard Tarnavarik, about 10 years before 1976, advocated posterior pubectomy and omental wrap that we still do in very complex posterior injury patients. Position is important. <coughs> we usually give what is called a Lloyd Davis lithotomy position of, for a patient who needs an abdominal perineal resection of, of the um, rectum uh, with Allen stirrups with sequential calf compression device. So the patient is in a simple lithotomy position. A few of my American friends um, offer the patient an exaggerated lithotomy position and they're happy with it. The next step is to do a cystoscopy through the suprababic tract. We use a mini nephroscope because usually the tract is 14 French. We use a 12 French mini nephroscope. Have a look at the bladder neck. On the left, you can see a normal bladder neck. In the center, you can see a wide open bladder neck. It could be a neurogenic or occasionally one may have a teardrop deformity or a keyhole deformity where a bony fragment has ruptured the circle um, at 12 o'clock and um, the circle is broken, it forms a teardrop deformity. We also evaluate patients for bladder stones um, uh, and occasionally I have seen a uh, tip of a Foley catheter for long-standing um, uh, suprababic tract maybe for 15 or 20 years. Next step is to make a midline perineal incision and through that incision, which is about 8 to 10 centimeter long, mobilize the bulbourethra circumferentially 
proximally up to the site of obliteration and distally i insert a finger between the dissected urethra and the corpora cavernosa and i pull the penis up my finger should not approach the penile portion of the urethra otherwise and we stop at the penosotal junction if i enter the penile urethra then um, there may be chance of cordy second procedure uh, is a corporal separation two corpora are cylinders so if i use a sharp knife 15 number blade and make very fine strokes then the knife will fall between the two mountains in a valley and then i can make an incision um, under vision and then i apply two uh, alice clamps and then i can insert my scissors behind because most attachment is mostly anterior i can insert my scissors behind the atta um, attachment of the corpora and then I, i can open up and then once i do that i insert another mastoid retractor in upside down down position and then we see the deep dorsal vein which is usually large in the midline now lateral to the deep dorsal vein are the dorsal arteries which is the blood supply going to the um, glands and if for any reason we use an inverted u uh, sh shape of um, dissection um, in this region to make uh, space for pubectomy there is a chance that one may obliterate the dorsal arteries and that's the reason many patients have what are called bulbar urethral ischemic necrosis so i make an incision in the midline on the periosteum take the vein on one side if it is too big then one can ligate the, only the vein then bend the tip of the electrode and insert it below the periosteum this is most important point you must do dissection below the periosteum if you are above then there is a chance of you know, damaging risk of damaging the dorsal arteries then i use a hammer and gouge we have three sizes 5 10 and 15 um, mm wide uh, usually in adults we use 10 mm wide in children i use 5 mm wide hammer and gouge and we make a, a small pubectomy for my index finger to go in so this allows excision of the scar and um, rotation of the needle Um, in the center you can see i have opened the urethra there is a forceps going into the um, posterior urethra and there is white scar how to identify the posterior urethra now there are two dilators on the left on the curved one is called hegros buji um, it is really nice instrument um, but it it has a fixed curve the second dilator is a pediatric dilator we use a 14 dilator my mentor dr barbagli does not like like a dilator to be used because it's a blind procedure and once in a while uh, you may open up uh, urethra at a wrong side and do anastomosis to a wrong spot and uh, we can collect a fistulous connection between urethra and the bladder <clears throat> if i use a rigid scope then the rigid scope with a low spc stops just distal to the veru and if i open up urethra on a rigid endoscope like a mini nephroscope ureteroscope or a cystoscope i may be opening the proximal urethra more proximally rather than at the apex so the best technique uh, is hosseini hosseini from iran described the technique where um, he passed a flexible cystoscope from above so you can go much more distal to the veru at the apex of membranous urethra pass a needle from the perineum initially your needle may not come into the center with one or two attempts one can go at the apex of membranous urethra the importance of this point will come into those patients where there is a double transection of the urethra or there is a bladder neck trauma because this um, judicial uh, needle insertion is very important to achieve continence in some patients next is to excise the um, fibrotic scar judiciously we want to stay in the midline don't venture too much laterally and then excise the scar the scar is white firm and non mobile and the urethra is pink soft and mobile once you can see on the right there is urethra very nicely spatulated uh, not spatulated very nicely opened up and there are 12 sutures taken this slide from my friends in america where they usually take 12 sutures in, in india <clears throat> we take about 6 sutures 1 3 
five, seven, nine, and eleven. I don't take twelve o'clock suture because if I take twelve o'clock suture, there could be a six o'clock suture required, which is towards the rectum. And then we tie the knots inside. This is a very important point. A lot of discussion goes around it. Knot in the tissue versus knot in the lumen. Knot in the tissue has a more fibrosis, mm, uh, and that, uh, this goes against the principle of plastic surgery. Not in the lumen, it can fall off and there is less fibrosis. Once, um, once in a while, I get an adolescent boy whose penis and the bulb urethra are not well developed. And if he comes to me with two failed urethroplasties, each time we do anastomotic urethroplasty, um, he loses about a centimeter of the bulb urethra. So when he comes to me after one or two failed surgeries, I cannot do anastomotic urethroplasty directly. So occasionally we use this supracrural rerouting, you know, go above the left corpora, make a pubectomy of the inferior pubic ramus on that side, and your finger should go above the left corpora, and then the anastomosis becomes easy. Otherwise, the other alternative in this patient um, is substitution urethroplasty with a prepucial skin. There are two anastomoses and a skin line urethra, which forms a diverticulum. So this is this supracrural rerouting should not be taken lightly and the urethra may get engulfed in a bony tunnel. So I don't advocate it routinely. There are some situations where I use abdominal approach. This is the midline, period, midline abdominal incision and then we do posterior pubectomy. And then on the right, you can see this um, uh, laparotomy and pubectomy and there is a anastomosis deep inside the abdomen. And this happens for the patients who have what we call pi in the sky bladder. After excision of a bone, bone, posterior pubectomy and scar, there is a lot of dead space created. So Richard Turner Burdick advocated omental wrap, which acts as an abdominal policeman, helps in absorption of exudate and keeps the um, urethral anastomosis supple, which is very important. So before I tie the sutures, I must do cystourethroscopy either from below and up or from above. And I must document that I am joining the urethra at the proper spot, I must see the verru and I must see the bladder neck. Uh, on the right, you can see an anastomosis done to a false passage here. Uh, uh, there are many ways in which I can uh, have a retractor inside the urethra. On the left, you can see a teal's gorget in the center, um, a nasal speculum on the right, and Debicki forceps for CB open, which keeps the urethra open, and I can insert sutures. And we published a paper on re-redo urethroplasty after pelvic fracture urethral injuries, and the success rate hovers between 75 to 85 percent. Mm. How to spatulate the urethra? This is the apex of membranous urethra, and I don't because this is sphincteractive. I do not want to spatulate it, and the in the bulbar portion, urethra lies dorsally, so the natural spatulation of is dorsal. This is an ideal situation. Mm, there are other techniques of spatulation. On the left, you can see the uh, proximal urethra spatulated anteriorly. In the second, you can see the urethra mm, uh, is spatulated anteriorly and the bulb urethra is spatulated ventrally. And then in the third portion, you can see the urethra is spatulated posteriorly in the proximal portion. And occasionally one can rotate the bulb urethra. Mm, this is uh, done rarely, but I have Mm, rotated the urethra uh, 180 degrees and is perfectly acceptable. It doesn't block the urethra. Richard Tanwar used to say that failure rate of more than 7% is not acceptable. One has to go and relearn the technique. And you can see a pre and post operative um, RGU MCU of the patient. And this is a long term success. We published many articles on complex and redo cases for pelvic fracture urethral injuries. I want to introduce this new series of patients uh, aged less than two years uh, with what we call iatrogenic posterior urethral injury. These are boys born with high imperforate anus. They always survive only if they have a recto urethral fistula. So they are treated with uh, colostomy at birth and later on they undergo posterior sagittal anorectal pull through P SARP operation. During this procedure from behind, Many times they want to close the urethro erectile um, fistula and I have a series of five boys where the posterior urethra was obliterated. Now in this um, boy, 
uh, less than two years, I had to do bulbarethra mobilization, crural separation, inferior pubectomy, and then you can see this uh, tiny retractor on the left. In the center, I'm taking a suture through the proximal urethra, and you can see the incision in this boy. So uh, doing a tiny pubectomy um, and inserting a needle and tying knots becomes very difficult. But this type of anastomotic urethroplasty is not described in the literature today. Then we have a series of boys with what called pie in the sky bladder. So normally the bladder neck is at the level of the superior part of the symphysis. Here the posterior urethra is in the abdomen. So we do an abdominal incision, do posterior pubectomy, and do anastomosis in the abdomen. We also have a series of young girls with pelvic fracture urethral trauma. They usually have urethral vaginal fistula. So these girls need <coughs> an MRI scan. And then um, I do not want to do any surgery from vagina. So we do an abdominal approach, transpubic urethroplasty, dissect two ends of the urethra between the excise the scar between the two ends of the urethra, go and repair the <coughs> vaginal fistula, do anastomotic urethroplasty, and use omental wrap. We have another series of very interesting patients. They have um, double block, one at the bulbo membrane junction, which is common, and second block at the bladder neck prostate junction. In young adolescents who are ejaculating, they form uh, a collection of semen into the posterior urethra, where the semen can't go into the bladder, can't go outside, and they have painful ejaculation. So we request an MRI. Uh, they need an abdominal perineal approach. On the right, you can see I have inserted a needle into the um, prostatic urethra from abdomen and I have aspirated the semen here. And then I, um, the important part is we have to identify the apex of um, posterior urethra. Tony Mundy in one of his articles suggested that 85% patients of PFUI, pelvic fracture urethra injuries, have a reasonable external sphincter. And then if you do anastomosis judiciously, um, uh, the patients are okay. Initially, two of my patients were in, incontinent because I did two wide anastomosis. And so now with the modified approach of judicious excision of the scar at the apex of membranous urethra, next seven patients are continent. Uh, one may have uh, occasional nocturnal dribbling. Now comes a difficult um, pa patient series of 116 patients, around 10% of our total series. Now, once you transect the bulbar urethra, one, it gets blood supply in a retrograde fashion. Retrograde fashion through the corpora cavernosa, through the dorsal artery of the penis, uh, into the glands, and through the penile urethra. Now, um, if there is hypospadias, if there is erectile dysfunction due to vascular injury, or somebody has not done proper inferior pubectomy, then the patient will lose his bulbar urethra. There is a long gap created. The first choice of treatment is if the patient has prepuce, we have a mechanic flap, we do circumcision incision and deglow the penis twice, once below the skin, one below the fascia, transfer the prepuce to the perineum and make a three centimeter wide and maybe seven centimeter long um, tube um, and join it proximal and distally. The problems are uh, there are two anastomoses and a skin line urethra, so they may form a diverticulum. We had two patients with um, horrific accidents who had hindquarter amputation and a loss of uh, testes on one side, lot of uh, loss of urethra, uh, loss uh, shaving of penile skin, so there was nothing for us to repair. And the boy wanted to walk with uh, artificial calipers, so we had to use the sigmoid colon and the technique was this is described in BJUI by Professor Mundy. Mm, we have published our series of patients and the difference in developing developed countries between India and Italy. And there is another paper on laparoscopic omentoplasty where we bring the omentum out of male perineum for, for rectoethral fistula and for mm, complex cases. Mm, with my mentor Guido Barbagli. We wrote a book on art of urethral reconstruction and we recently have published textbook of male genito urethral reconstruction. Uh, there are another book chapters in two um, uh, important books published in the literature. Uh, I thank University of Southern California and Professor Indigel and Leo uh, for inviting me for this talk. I have shared my experience of last 33 years with you.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kulkarni. Do we have time for a few questions or Dr. Yeah. Gill? Should so we I, I think, I up? think just, just get some, a uh, little bit of panel discussion about five minutes with Dr. Wessels and uh, Dr. Barbaglia and Kulkarni. So just one or two questions. Maybe they can ask each other. That'll be even better. Uh, right now. Well, why don't I bring something up for Dr. Wessels and Dr. Kokarni? I know, Dr. Kokarni, that you're a tertiary or quaternary referral center. And I saw your new data, Dr. Wessels, on your uh, update on the endoscopic realignment. Why don't you two have a little back and forth about that real quick? So Hunter has a great experience because he is the uh, patients from five states come to him as a tertiary referral center. And most of the patients that I treat are, uh, they had an accident before or failed urethroplasty. So I'm into uh, supraabdominal tube uh, followed by uh, delayed anastomotic repair. That's my expertise. But Hunter, your comments on endoscopic realignment? I think it's the reason we don't understand the results is because we don't have a good gauge of injury severity. And I think the uh, damage to the pelvic floor, the ischemia, and the other factors going on during trauma are unmeasured. And there's fortunately a multi-center prospective cohort study um, organized under the umbrella of the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma that hopefully will capture a wider range of injury severity and answer this question. Because you're right, our our results on the severely injured patients at our center aren't as good as what we see elsewhere. And we need to understand that. I suspect that we'll be able to identify a subset of people for whom it makes sense uh, based on injury characteristics and we do the realignment and there are others who we just say SP tube and wait three months. When I spoke to Charles Best from USC, he told me that we had a, um, a debate in AUS a few years ago. He told me that Whenever a patient of fracture pelvis comes, they do this endoscopic realignment within four hours of injury. And he says most of his patients don't need urethroplasty. So I have not seen anywhere in the world where they are so, so good in treating injury patients. Another question, Dr. Kulkarni, real quick. Can you just talk about this 3D complex modeling that you're doing as an educational adjunct? I think that's really cool and you're really on to something. So my colleague, Dr. Pankaj Joshi is an expert in radiology. And what he is doing is that we have two fellows um, and they want to learn about pubectomy and complex urethroplasty. So we do a 3D CT scan um, and then um, we ask uh, a 3D printer guy. It takes about, it, they're a bit slow. It takes about one day for us to get a model and costs about $100 a year. So we can have a look at the, um, uh, the plastic model where we can judge whether the posterior urethra, how deep it is, whether there is in a girl, whether the urethra vagina fistula, so we can plan surgery better, uh, what kind of pubectomy the patient may need. Very cool. Dr. Wessels, question. What percent of patients do you perform sonography on in the OR intraoperatively for your strictures? <clears throat> Really, it's only the short strictures that I think are going to be amenable either to an EPA or maybe a non-transecting approach. I want to get a good sense that it's really short enough that I can go ahead and make one of those definitive moves. Uh, because I don't want to transect the urethra if I don't have to or I shouldn't. So that's the, the limited group. Very good. And Dr. Kulkarni, you always have the sonography with you in the OR? No. Or Doppler, I you did that before. He does I, bought a machine to do, I bought a machine to do this ultrasonography. We tried it on a few patients. But um, we do about 500 urethroplasties per year. And may, I may transect the bulbar urethra maybe less than four times a year because the trauma for the bulbar portion is uncommon. Mm, and then uh, most of the time, I would like to transect only when there is history of trauma. Otherwise, I would like to augment the urethra. This is the message that I want to give to my friends that 
Now, transecting vulvar urethra is a major event in a young sexually active male, and the vulvar urethra uh, is and glands are the, sa are the same unit. So, don't try to transect the urethra. I always considered vulvar urethra similar to mid ureter. We never transect the ureter unless we know what we are going to do. We can open the ureter as long as we want. So, transection of bulbar urethra is a big no-no. So, there is a Guido story that Guido uh, transected urethra in one guy. He came for a follow-up. His flow rate was excellent. And he said, Dr. Barbagli, you ruined my life. He said, what happened? My glance is cold. No, we never ask this question to a patient whether your glance is cold or whether it is as turgid as before. Mm. So, Guido, your experience? Yes, 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 yes. No, no, the, the gland was cold and not fully, was swollen. Mm. And this was a 37 year man that say, doctor, thank you. You destroy my life because now I am divorced because I am not able to do sexual intercourse with my wife. Thank you very much. And go home <laughs> and go out. For this reason, yeah. I, I start checking what happened after end to end anastomosis. I make a questionnaire in all my patients, and we discover that 20% of the patients had uh, sexual, uh, not impotence, but uh, uh, decreased the sensitivity, the glands was swollen, cold, uh, decreased the sensitivity of, of the penis. So you know my opinion. I don't like to transect the urethra, only in traumatic stricture, not in uh, other way, no, no. Well, that gets back to understanding the mechanism of injury and what's the cause of the stricture. The other thing is that some men will have some ejaculatory dysfunction, and I'm not quite sure why, but if they don't have forward propulsion of the semen, I think that's also a big problem. I've only seen that once or twice. And that's sort of where we're going with results. We need to get these patient-recorded outcomes for pain and erect erectile and ejaculatory function for urethroplasty. One more question for Dr. Uh, Guido and you, Hunter. Do you guys close your buccal mucosal graft sites or not? No, 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 no. Good. Thank you for question. We present our result in Journal of Urology, 553 patients closing the harvest inside. This patient satisfaction was 82%. The early and the late complication was uh, about uh, insignificant. Now we are arranging a new paper collecting uh, 875 patients, the same study, and we discover that when we harvest the oral mucosa for only one site and we close, the patient satisfaction is very, very high and the complication rate is very, very low. When we harvest bilateral graft, or we, we do combined graft from the cheek from, and the combined from the lip or for the tongue, the patient satisfaction is uh, very bad. The patient is unsatisfied, don't like, don't like. So for this reason, we close the, the harvesting uh, site when we take uh, ovoidal graft. When we take a rectangular graph, as I show you in my slide, we don't close, but the patient is unsatisfied. He has a bleeding for a few days, he has a swelling, so don't like. So. It, the only thing I have to add is that very few patients, regardless of how you close it, have a long-term complication. I only have three patients who've needed reoperative surgery on their mouth because of donor site complications. What but, uh, I would, after closure, you, you close uh, or not? Usually they were the larger grafts. Ah, after larger, larger graft, graft yeah. without closing, without closing. Yeah, you can't close it. So then of some course, people talk course. about putting some dermis or something in there. But uh, Leo, I'd like to argue that what we need to do is get beyond single surgeon series, even large ones, and try and develop more of a registry approach to GU reconstruction where we can really get uh, a broader variation in surgeons, patients, and, and uh, use these outcome measures that we're all discussing. 
I think that's the next wave for our society and for our specialty to, to help us achieve the kind of consistent results across the world. Okay. On that note. Leo, uh, yes. in, 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 in India, we get patients who chew tobacco. So we have to take little bigger graphs and more. I treat a lot of pan urethral structures. So we take rectangular long graphs and we, we cannot close those patients, especially if I take it from both and we leave them alone. Some patients may have some problem with opening, um, but uh, we normally do not close. We ask the patient to blow the cheek later on when that's, that's okay. So th there's a difference of disease pattern in various parts of the world. Very good. Now I'll pass it to Dr. Gill for some closing remarks. Thank you gentlemen so much for Thank everything. You. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. A round of applause. My God, uh, what a treat. What a treat. Uh, this was not uh, three lectures by three surgeons. This was three lectures by three artists. Uh, I just my hat off to you for taking a very, very complex uh, uh, scenario that just fundamentally um, compromises uh, the person's life and then restoring it. Uh, you've helped so many patients, so many people, and you know, God bless you guys. Um, my biggest compliment to you is looking at your talks today. I feel I'm ready for a GU reconstruction fellowship. Robotics is for the birds. I want to get into re re through reconstruction. Uh, but again, thank you on behalf of everybody to uh, Guido Barbaglia, to Sanjay Kulkarni, to Hunter Wessels, and to Leo Domanian. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you also to Gio and Ani for um, um, you know putting this together. Guys, have a great day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye from USC. Thank you. Thank you, USC. Be safe, everybody. Romani, grazie di tutto.